Let me introduce President Marit, who will be the moderator for this session. And she is not only our SI president, she is also the president of the Seroptimist International and Women for Water Partnership. Okay, so over to you, Marit. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for coming. I mean, you can also all sit here a little bit further down, but uh, uh, it's, no, it's not, uh, not a big problem. Um, sorry about changing the rooms, but at the time we saw we were oversubscribed for this room and we couldn't get in there. So I hope the confusion isn't too, uh, too big. Uh, what we would like to do... Uh, I think it was a wonderful presentation this morning. I think everyone got inspired on how to continue and what to do, and we'll go on and answer your questions, if I get them, because I haven't seen them yet. They, are, they must be somewhere here, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe you can, uh, ladies, maybe you can find the questions that were not answered, because I didn't see them. But before we go on to questions, I would like to introduce Mary Muya and Enasha Abdulrahman. And she, uh, these two wonderful ladies uh, are going to um, have short presentations, um, a little bit changed after this morning, uh, on climate change. We call this meeting, this, this work, um, uh, work plan, this, this, this uh, session, Climate change, is climate change a she? So that's what we are going to invent and to, to find out. So I think I uh, give the floor. I'm not going to introduce all these wonderful ladies again because you know them all now. So I start with uh, chair of the task force of uh, uh, Stroptimus International African Federation, uh, Mary Moya. Good after tea, everyone. I'm very excited again just to share the DAS with you and to reflect on this very good topic about mitigating the burden of climate change on women and girls. Do we have opportunities? And how can we sustain if we have solutions? So I think this is a build-up from the morning session, and it is uh, quite an honor to have the entire panel from the morning session who set the curtain for us. So it's just a continuation. Uh, so I think we will just look into a few things here. Climate change affects everyone, and we saw that in the morning. But now we want to narrow it down to the woman. So is it a she or is it a he? So why, why should climate change bother you or me or us? What are the effects of climate change and what are the solutions? Climate change is, of course, the pattern in weather, and we saw that in the morning without repeating that we were able to be told by the speakers that uh, this is what it is. It is affecting us in terms of weather, in terms of change of uh, agricultural patterns in our uh, countries, particularly in Africa. And it's also the way that uh, we want to look into it in, in the sense that how do we safeguard the empowerment of women and girls in the threat of climate change? Do we have... Uh, an opportunity to eradicate poverty among women and girls because climate change poses a lot of poverty issues for women and girls. Already, girls and women suffer a lot in terms of poverty. So climate change is worsening that. So matters to do with gender equality, with climate change uh, affecting us, we may never achieve the gender equality that we are looking at. So I would want us to urge ourselves in the work that we do and look at it in such a way that we will affect women positively and get them into the front line in climate action. Women will suffer more or rather suffer very disproportionately uh, from poverty. And when we have erratic weather changes, who suffers most? Recently, we had a lot of drought, uh, uh, floods and there was a big wave in, in, in uh, southern Africa. And we saw how families went homeless. Who was affected most? It must be a mother 
with children somewhere in that particular uh, in, uh, area. So we are looking at in terms that uh, women and girls have got more negative effects when we compare to men. Of course we know men will be affected, but the woman is affected much more intimately by matters of climate change. So the negative effects of climate change, I, I said, touch on agriculture. A woman goes to farm. She wants to feed up for her family. But when there is no enough rain, where does food come from? Who is looking at the family to say that uh, now we want food? But the woman says or looks uh, into the weather pattern and like, I did crop, but I have no yield. In other words, we do have um, very many women that rely on agriculture, and it is not a lie that uh, over 43% of the global workforce, 65% of, those are, 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 of them are involved even in livestock. They are women, most of them. We also look into the further impact on health for women and girls. In terms of nutrition and food security and production, women are going to be affected more when there is uh, uh, an outbreak of, of water-related uh, flood uh, conditions, the children are going to be having diarrhea. There is going to be poor nutrition because women don't have enough food. Who is going to be running around with sick children? And now then it means the women cannot do what they could do in terms of empowering themselves because climate change and the severe effects of it is affecting uh, us. The disasters that come with climate change are quite enormous. And when there is, um, you know, mi migration, we have got uh, displacement, whether internally or externally displaced people because of climate change, a lot of other bad things happen to women. There is increased gender-based violence and harassment for women and children, and this now even increases the risk of human trafficking. So we are saying that um, displacement and migration will result uh, into very unsafe poor living conditions for women and girls because of climate change. So really we cannot uh, ignore the fact that climate change is really a she or a woman in, in, in nature. So I would want to give exam uh, a few examples um, from the slide that follow and it's just a summary that uh, 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 climate change really precipitates uh, the cycle of poverty. We have, uh, uh, you know, insecure livelihood, uh, reduced crop production, which re leads into increased burden of household, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the woman has got to work much more to collect water because we have drought, and the girl will not go to school because she has got to bring water for the family. That makes the girl even poorer because then she will stop uh, schooling because we don't have enough water for the family. We also have loss of time uh, for education, and the uh, income, women cannot do business because climate change has brought severe conditions to us. And of course, we do have a very unreliable um, uh, data that shows how this problem exactly happens and how, what it does to the women and girl. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a um, uh, stop at the part that says the environmental uh, issues really in increase food insecurity. And we know without food, the woman is never going to be um, satisfied. They, they are not going to be uh, clear on what empowerment is all about. So really, climate change brings poverty to women and girls. I would want to have my colleague uh, Asha come forward to, to, to quickly share through, uh, go through the mitigation and what we are doing, particularly at the local level. So Asha, it's your turn. Good, mo good morning, ladies. I really feel privileged to present after all these powerful presenters. So I understand you're all by now uh, educated, you're all climate change agents, and you're all seeing what is best. What can I do? Your minds are working hard. There is a woman. That's what you're saying when it's climate change, she definitely climate change affects women. And I'm not sure if she would affect the others. If the woman was in charge of taking care of the climate change, it wouldn't go the way it is going. 
I'm giving you the effect, what we have done so far as solar optimists on mitigating the effects of climate change. Uh, some time back, we had a project, Kenya Union and the Danish Union. Uh, we worked on women and climate change, and we did a book on it. But as you know, our fans just didn't they allow us to continue the project. But that effect has been felt. We raise awareness, and if you go around, you will still see the people now know it is not a global thing. It's not there. It is here with us. So what we have done is they've raised awareness of the grassroots women, build their capacity to hold the governments responsible, and we are still doing it. Uh, we have now ensured, we are trying to ensure that the women have access to clean water. How we are doing it is your contributions when we bring the tanks and rainwater harvesting and the awareness has helped. Thank you very much. Food security is another effort area where it is affected by climate change, as you've heard from the speakers, because this year we have so much, we have planted about three times waiting for the rains. The rains should have come early March, late March, but they didn't come on time. So people have not planted. Right now, if you go to Kenya, we have no food. Last year we had bumper harvest. Now there's no food. Um, clean energy. She talked about clean energy. I th I'm sure the Sorofmis can say that. We have been trying to make sure that the women have, and our, even ourselves, we have solar-powered lighting. Africa has an issue of access to electricity, but we have ensured the women have solar power, and we are still trying to do it thanks to the Sorofmis efforts, and all of us are volunteers, but we are trying to do our best. Indoor pollution. That is the biggest killer because it affects the lungs and if you have to cook using charcoal or whatever, either you have uh, a lot of uh, carbon monoxide in the house or you have a lot of smoke so it affects the chest. So what we have tried to do that, we have tried to do in a very simple manner, build kitchen uh, stoves which have a, a chimney which doesn't, inf this, the smoke goes out. So you have cooking in a clean environment, and we have gone around to see, like last week I was there, the women are so happy. They have a clean kitchen where they can sit with their family and eat there because it is clean, and they can cook with less, less fuel, less firewood, and it is clean environment. Um, another thing is the biodiversity. We've taken care of biodiversity. We, every woman who works with us, has to plant trees. And we've gone around to ensure the trees have grown. And in our next report, you're going to see how the women have put, uh, you know, agriculture, agro, agro um, forestry, where you're planting trees and at the same time, you have your food. Because people feel that if I plant a tree, it's going to affect the soil. But that tree also uses, it helps you when it is too hot, it gives the shed. So those are simple projects which we have done. Very simple. And all of those we have been doing over time. And right now in Kenya, we are proud to say we are implementing the Presidential Appeal Project. I'm one of the implementers. And the women have sent their greetings to you and say, thank you very much. There's one man who said, tell the president, Marit, I am helping my wife because of what you have brought here. We have to ensure we have food throughout the year with as little water as we have. There's also a recycling solution, which we saw from the women. We all have to learn this way. You can't just take scientific, but we have to learn the, the effects women are doing. They're using all their washing water and their cleaning water and putting it in a, in a, in a, in a ground with a bit of covering, and they put ash and that removes all those residues, and they can use that water for irrigation. So those little solutions, those are the effects of how to mitigate effects of climate change. Because right now, unless we mitigate and we reverse it, we'll have no food, we'll have no water. In 50 years' time, probably we don't know what's going to happen. Thank you very much. And ladies, ladies, please, please go ahead and be agents of change 
continue contributing to whatever little you can do to affect another person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asha. It is very inspiring because it's not only that they have changed the mindset that the women are more healthy because they haven't got all these smokes in their kitchen, but the other thing that is really good, it's uh, economically empowering them because what we do is we teach them how to make those stoves. So it's not bought from somewhere or coming from the West. No, it's done by them. Of course, not all of them can do it, but they found a new profession and they do that in other villages or in their own village. And that is a really good uh, progress. And the other thing I, I thought I have to tell you because it was really, really funny. Um, the women had solar, um, solar light and uh, one of these little boys came up to me and he said, this is horrible. Can't you do anything about it? My mum wants me to do homework. Where is the television? <laughs> so I thought, well, he said, if you work hard on your homework, you can buy your own television later. <laughs> so... I still have to introduce um, Kusum, because Kusum is, um, was the keynote speaker in the water and food security, and I think she belongs here in this climate, because climate change, we, what we, at a certain stage with Women for Water, um, uh, Jacqueline was talking about the, uh, the different uh, COPs that, hap that happened, the climate change meetings, and after Paris, where what was the first time that the water people were invited, were actually allowed to come, because that was a little bit of an issue beforehand, uh, we started with other organizations the campaign Climate is Water. And it slowly, slowly uh, sort of uh, trickled down. And then when we had the COP in Marrakesh, we had a big campaign and we opened up. And I think it's slowly getting, uh, getting to the grassroots. So uh, that is also one of the reasons why Kusum is here. So you've heard what was done on the ground, uh, at the ground, uh, the grassroots. And the grassroots are... Um, our clubs, are our projects. Um, it is a shame that we don't have one big uh, website where all our projects are promoted because that would really show. We always, I mean, I come to a lot of uh, Sroptimist uh, meetings and annual meetings of uh, federations and then they say, why are we one of the best kept secrets. Maybe everyone has got the answer now because they can't find what we're actually doing. And it is not giving money to big organizations like Red Cross. We can work with them, but then we have to be recognized. Of course, we can work with everyone, but now we have to be recognized and we have to show the things that we are doing. So, I think after this, after showing what we're doing on the, on the, at, the ground, uh, at the grassroots, maybe we can go back a little bit to what in the world we can do. This was mainly focused on Africa, also a little bit on Asia, I think. But uh, every single country in the world will have an issue with water. Even in my country, which is, well, almost, uh, I think, half... Half is under the sea level, or a bit less, I don't know. Or maybe a bit more, I don't know. So, but even there, we had last year, for the first time, we had a wonderful, we thought it was wonderful, a wonderful warm uh, summer. And uh, they already started saying, oh my God, you can't all have a shower at the same time because the system, I mean, we've got the water, but the system doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't work like that. So I think uh, water scarcity will be a big issue for everyone. I mean, if I talk to people from the United States, California, where we were um, a bit earlier this year, uh, it's a major, major issue. And um, so... I would like to go back uh, to the questions that you all had. 
And maybe you've got more questions and you can please come up and, and ask for your question or tell, tell us the question. I'm sure one of the microphones can be used for that. Uh, uh, so one was that um, they would really like your Mums for Peace um, slide uh, back, um, back on the screen. But maybe we can do that. Uh, we can post that somewhere on our, um, on our um, uh, website. And then, uh, if I go through this, I think this was already a little bit sad, uh, sort of explained before. So what are we going to do um, to the people who always say, we have had climate change for centuries, as long as human beings exist. So why would we get upset about it? Um, I think that's a question that it has been answered, but maybe we can shortly implement it in other questions. And then the other one, which is uh, again on the Soroptimist, and that is what we said that we were going to do in this session, sort of what are we as Soroptimist going to do is, okay, can Soroptimist advocate their goals to have special um, a governmental focus and units to link energy usage, food production, and the impact on climate change on their agenda at a local, uh, a local level. Uh, and something I would like to come back to later after this question, I think, is the small islands. But not only the small islands here, but also um, I've been to the um, SI Great Britain and Ireland um, convention and uh, all the people from uh, the Caribbean came up and said, we don't pollute as much as our big friends north and south of us. So... We get, the, we get the bill. I mean, who is going to help us pay for the damage that's been done? And um, that is a big issue. Also in my country, it's a big issue. Sort of who is, how much are they going to pay? And um, should only the, com the, the countries involved pay? Or should maybe the big countries around them who pollute, although they say they don't, but they do pollute, um, should also have a say. And who can actually uh, sort of focus on that? Who can implement that? And can we be of some, some help? So maybe this time I'll start at Kuso. Could you have something on the first question when we had on what we were talking about, the relation uh, climate is water? And then we go on to the questions that they have been asking on um, what we uh, could do as uh, as optimists in our countries uh, with the other ladies and with the people who don't um, who don't understand that it is a big issue. Would you mind, or do you want to wait for the other ladies first? Uh, Kusum would like to have one key issue. She, she, oh, she issue. She, Good. She issue. Well, we would love to hear the she issues. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Marit. Uh, I know what it is to be hijacked now. Uh, I'm sorry for if I'm parachuting into your session, but I'm very happy it gives me the platform because I've been listening. I'm not a sort optimist, but I've been listening to a lot of what you're doing and... Why are you so invisible? Why is your issues a Cinderella issue? When is it going to the ball? So uh, let me just point one thing that you could do and that we have been doing maybe with the Global Water Partnership. You know, live streaming was used so awfully in the Christchurch massacre. But can't you use live streaming positively with all your projects? You do that. I mean, and the world gets to know what a lot of things that you're doing and doing so well, if I may say so. Well, the second one that I would, on the who pays issue, it's a major problem. Sri Lanka, I mean, our emissions are nothing, but we are paying a heavy price. As much as you said, Asha, about having f f droughts 
food insecurity, we are having the same. So how do we get out of this cycle? One is the word that I used in my uh, first keynote speech. We need to integrate. All our efforts are scattered. Integration, integration, integration is the word that I would have to, you know, emphasize. Because if we say, oh, this is a women's issue, very often we are not going to get the response that we need. But if we can integrate this into the national issue, we are 52% of the Sri Lankan population are women, and quite a lot of them are younger women, we get our point. The last one, uh, let me tell you a very quickly a funny story. I was the first to start on gender and irrigation in Sri Lanka. The problem is that my language doesn't have a word for gender. It never did. And so we, now we have a long term. So uh, when I went to the field and I was doing work, the irrigation engineer was very cooperative, but he had this funny look on his face. So when my male colleague came along, he said, you know, sex, sex is, what has sex got to do with irrigation? <laughs> because the only word we have is sex. So I think that if you can also, we are coming, you are coming from multiple countries, multiple languages, sometimes make sure you work on the same thought because the thinking may be different, the languages are different. So, you know, you could say, for instance, I'm going to tell you what has menstruation got to do with climate change. Menstruation has a lot to do with climate change. If your role is to educate and empower young women, please remember that they don't go to school because they don't have toilets that they can use, or especially when they have their periods. And if you do not have, I, in my presentation again, I said that, you know, the women are the foot soldiers of climate change. If you do not educate the younger women, these people will never grow up to be generals of climate change. Thank you. Thank you. I think now we ask um, the rest of the panel on... Um, uh, can I start with you, um, Kanta? Thank you. A couple of points that I wanted to raise in response to your question. The first one I think you mentioned was has climate change not always been there? What's different today? And I think one thing is really the rate and pace of change. But let me give you an example that really shows the dilemma of the local people in terms of climate change. I've worked a lot in Yemen, and Yemen, as you know, is those countries have always had, you know, hydrological challenges. And when we worked with the rain-fed farmers, every year they would sow the seeds at the same time. And when they do it now, the rains do not come. And we said to them, well, why do you do it? They said, we have a 400-year-old almanac that we've been following. And that's what we do. And we said, but, you know, the weather patterns are changing. But the reality is, even as the best scientists, we can predict those rains beyond a certain point. And so they said, we only know what to go back to. So, I mean, this is really a sad story because... You have folks who know, but they have no means to do different. And I think we really have to, to meet that challenge. So it is changing for real from their perspective. But the second point I wanted to make is about the Soroptimis. Like everyone who is not a, perhaps a member, I was so surprised and so stormed when I saw the 120-something flags on day one. And I thought... What a powerful confederation you are, a federation of 129 countries. So my urge to you is really to raise your profile in that singular voice so that we don't just look at climate change as women disproportionately impacted. I'd like to think women disproportionately informing the solutions because I think you have so many solutions that can be taken forward at that level that I think I'd like to hear that solution that we are the she solution to climate change and I think you have that in your hands. So thank you. Juwaita. Thank you. I want to talk money. So uh, a Pakistani professor once told me that if in a village in Pakistan they want to build a well, it might cost $100. If the Pakistani government builds it, it probably costs $10,000. And if you ask the World Bank to build it, it'll cost $40,000 because they earn much more per hour. So 
the, the message that stuck in my head was that sometimes it's much cheaper to do things yourself. But let's come back to the $100 billion that was supposed to be coming onto the table in 2020 uh, next year. The first thing to note is that it's not part of the legally binding part of the Paris Agreement. It was put in the non-legally binding part of the Paris Agreement. The second thing to note is that we are not yet there at the $100 billion, and it's not clear who exactly has to pay. The wording is so vague that the idea is that maybe governments, maybe the private sector, maybe anybody else can join in paying. And what we are now noticing is that many developed countries are renaming existing funds as climate funds. And I sent a student to Nepal a few years ago to look at local adaptation plans of um, um, a local adaptation plan and when she arrived there it was a drinking water project because there was nothing to adapt to because there was nothing in that village. So what you're seeing is that um, aid money is being relabeled climate money and then the climate money is then being used for aid because there's nothing there. So it's really weird what's happening. And what also bothers me very much is that we now have in the Western world something called the trade and aid agenda. And I thought that we would be using um, our trade agenda to try and support aid, but now it's happening the other way around. We use the aid agenda to support trade. And what is happening is that a lot of money is going from public money to support fossil fuel exports to developing countries. So when I look at the money storyline, it's really quite disheartening. And uh, to come back to your question, how can Soroptimist raise money? I have a feeling that um, uh, to, uh, to a large extent, one has to think in terms of where can we find the solutions in ourselves, because the moment you go to a funding agent, you're being told to do things that they want you to do. And that makes things quite difficult. So you lose your freedom in some ways. So even if you get a dollar per person, you have more freedom from your Soroptimist members than if you get uh, $85,000 from an aid agent or uh, an other party. So um, I often tell my students from developing countries, because I teach, that uh, they have to try and figure out how to find their own solutions, because Western solutions may come with ties. Uh, with, it might be tied aid. Thank you. And that is why we want to do all our projects with the clubs, with the clubs on the ground, so that there they understand that they have to monitor and that they have to... Uh, and those are the projects that are really working best. So, but the money issue stays, stays a problem. Because, for instance, you, um, you can do these projects, uh, which is great, but you still need someone to... Um, uh, to evaluate someone to to get the project because not everyone is a project writer so to to put it in perspective and to actually show really show uh, in a professional way what has happened and how much impact we made maybe a quick suggestion is maybe master students who have to write theses and they are looking for projects all the time so maybe we could match our master students with your projects Yes, I've, I've once had a speech uh, at, the, uh, at the university, and, uh, but it's still, if you have a, a master's student, which is great, and we've, hey, we've done it with Women for Water Partnership, but they need guidance. And if we don't have money for someone in the secretariat and who can actually guide them, then, you know, it's a circle. Oh, thank you very much. You will do that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, Asha wants to react to this, and then we'll go to Jacqueline. Uh, thank you very much. What you have said is true. We had uh, done the project, which we did, and we then had all the government people, the industrialization, the government uh, environment, sitting on our panel, because we call them, be our steering committee in this project. So they are the ones who are overseeing what we are doing. So that one of the government officers the Prime Minister's office called us and said, okay, come, we are also implementing what you're doing. You're giving solar, you're giving solar powers, come and give with us. But they commented, you're using so little money doing what you're doing. For us, we'd have used much, much more. And this is everywhere. We did toilets and somebody said, oh, you used about 600,000? That would have been 2 million. So it's correct, it's true. 
Thank you. This is Kenny a shilling. This is not dollars. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, Jacqueline, can you react? Yeah, well, um, what Joyeta said about the, uh, the finances is really worrying. Uh, I talked about and negotiated about money for less developing countries 10 years ago. Same discussion and no uh, good answers until now. And it, that is really horrifying. And also, if you see where the money goes, then it does not go to the right places and with far too much money for the people who have already money. So we really have to change that. And um, what I think is that if we uh, can manage, and that's why I stress that so much in my presentation, that the people themselves, and especially you, women, Sir Optimist, and also grassroots movements with which you can team up, can really uh, uh, put their hands together. That's the, the remark you made, Kusun. Don't think in silos, but think in allies and uh, integration of what you are doing. Because then you are a really forceful power to show that with local projects you can really make a change. But I also want to come back to the uh, remark Kanta made in the previous uh, dialogue, and that was about the levels where you can uh, achieve impact. Of course, local projects are important, especially to show that we can really make the change and that it is not as costly as they all calculate. That's one. But of course, you have to also influence other levels. And at your own government level, I think you have now the, the power to really change because the uh, UNFCCC showed that you women need to have more impact in decision making. And what I would like to propose is that you uh, develop with the help of those who can do that, and there are people in your own countries that can do that, to set up an alternative uh, strategy for a low carbon or carbon neutral uh, society and make a real action plan and show that this action plan is workable, it's a better plan, it, it, and sometimes the, your country doesn't have even a plan, so you put on, uh, on the table a good plan, which is involving the people in society, which also gives hope that people understand that it's really something they can uh, help solve. And with this new strategy, you can really work on the solutions that can accelerate the process. And that is really necessary. And the last uh, question uh, that was raised was about the uh, climate change figures. Well, it has already been, been said by Kanta. The, uh, and I showed a graph of and a, a pink uh, a, a part where you see that uh, during Holocene we have seen ch changes in the temperature, but after uh, 1960s onwards we have seen that the uh, pass is accelerating and, and just exceeding very much the normal pattern. And that slide shows in a nutshell what is happening. So uh, we can have a discussion about people who don't believe this graph uh, and then uh, we, we need to also uh, mobilize other arguments to show. But I think the most par powerful way to show that we can really uh, make the change is by doing, by doing, by acting at all levels and join forces. And you, Sir Optimist, have every possibility to do that with your enormous uh, support of women in the world. So please, don't think in silos, don't think in, in, in differences, but in commonalities. Thank you very much. I think that's very clear. Uh, join hands and start action. Uh, Kusum, you had a little remark. I, I, just one thought of being proactive. Uh, you know, as we 
as has been said, finance is a major issue, but I have talked to so many people here, and why not you set up your own task force of financing? Because you have banking people here, you have development people here, you tap into their energies, their skills, and especially their networks. This is all about networking, seeing where the money is and you know, going after it. So perhaps if you can do that, that could bring in the money that your development people at ground level can then follow up on. You know, let's yes. not always say there is no money or we can't access the money. You have movers and shakers here in the audience. Yeah. We definitely have movers and shakers. And that is also why there's another workshop, uh, which is uh, called the E-Future of Optimist International, uh, where we are... Um, sort of uh, planning um, a communication platform for all Soroptimists, where all Soroptimists can be uh, a member of the platform, and then we can work in groups, in groups of expertise. And it can be finance, it can be um, environmental issues, it can be development, it can be anything. And I think if we do that, and we can ask questions to all these people, all, well, let's start with our 75,000 members, uh, all these question, questions like, uh, for instance, we were at the CSW, and I needed um, a journalist uh, to say something uh, in a session. And I thought, gosh, I don't I don't know one now. If we would have such a communication platform, then we would, it would be so easy to just put a question there, only f you know, for the store optimist, uh, and say, listen, who's coming to the CSW, or who would like to come to the CSW, and who can speak? And then, and that will really streamline our actions. So uh, I know that Mary wanted to react. Thank you. I think I agree with all the panelists. And one more other opportunity that we have as optimists is the, the work that we do at the United Nations. In Nairobi at the UNEP uh, Assembly, uh, we've had uh, four general assemblies. And the fourth one, for the first time, had a focus on gender, environmental, and governance. And we had a resolution that was passed, and that, uh, that resolution gives us a good chance to hold governments responsible for us to uh, raise matters on human rights for women who are defending the environment and perhaps they are being, you know, tasked by their governments. So we need to know that uh, as Sir Optimist at the global level, we have our voice at the UN, but then that cascades down to what we can do in our clubs. We want to mobilize the women to take action, for them to know that climate change is really a big uh, impact on, on our households. Thank you. And the other thing is, uh, it's not only top down, it's rather bottom up. Because what we do also at Women for Water Partnership is actually listening to our grassroots uh, members and, and projects and then try to bring them up. If they can't bring the questions or the, the sessions up, I mean, we do it for them. And, uh, we, and that's why capacity building is so important and education. And it's all what we do, and it's really working together. I think that is one of the... We now have members... Uh, Sir Optimist is a member of Women for Water Partnership, but there are more members, and I think we should, uh, we should continue doing that. So... Uh, can we go back, go to the uh, next question, um, and that was on the small islands. I mean, is there a possibility? I know we are not forceful enough uh, yet, let's say it that way, uh, to actually influence governments um, to have a look at the, um, uh, at the way the uh, climate change is distributed, let's call it like that. Uh, it's really the, um, and it was said by m more than one person, climate change is affecting the, the poor, the people who are left behind, and um, it's caused by the people who are rich and getting richer. And uh, how are we going to be able to influence it? And I think, I know it's a little bit political, but maybe you can have, a, a Jacqueline, a sort of uh, idea on, on where we, apart from, yeah, no, 
have an answer. <laughs> well, perhaps I can make it personal because your last sentence about who caused it and who ha has, is most affected uh, is really something uh, which uh, alarms me and, and really uh, is, 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 is the real problem also to solve the, the issue. And uh, uh, my presentation, uh, my speech at, at the um, conference in Copenhagen was actually only about the small island states. And I addressed them as being the first to be uh, impacted. And secondly, the parts of the world that already suffer from droughts and floods at present. These are the people that will be hurt first. And we actually don't have that much technology anymore because the, it, the time is running. So I am really alarmed, and not I personally only, but the whole world should be because of that. Because we can always think in technical solutions, but the time is over for te technical solutions for those, those islands and those countries. So um, that's why 10 years ago, I already stressed that, that point, and it was not about nothing else. You, you can look at the uh, internet for that speech. But uh, the, the main reason I did that because, is because I think people should be alarmed by, by only that message. What, what are we doing in this world? So... And I think what you said earlier, I mean, if we join hands with the youth, I mean, the fact that young uh, girls, I mean, girls and boys come up and leave school to protest against the slow reaction of the government, maybe we can help them out here and, and can join them as mothers, as, as, as aunts, as, as whatever, to actually say, yes, we agree. Because, to be very honest, I mean, what am I going to say uh, to the future if, uh, if they ask me, what did you do? What did you do? I mean, I'm living in, an, in a world... Uh, probably the West is now going to be, the women are going to be about 90. So what, they will say, what happens? Uh, what, why didn't you do anything at the time? Now we are, it's unlivable. Marit, may, may I ask something? Because there was a good proposal of Yoyeta. Uh, I did a similar proposal about uh, a worldwide com campaign. With, uh, is there a, a possibility for you as an optimist to trigger this kind of uh, common action uh, of youth, of uh, indigenous women, of all the women in the world. I mean, if we can mobilize society in a, in a very impactful way, this helps. That's already what Greta Thunberg showed, what the powerful ladies I also mentioned are doing. But, you know, one voice, one voice, and then all together. And a global voice. And I think we can do that. And that could be one of the uh, conclusions and resolutions at the end of this, uh, uh, this convention. Sort of action in, um, in the media, in everywhere where we can, and with one global voice. Our... Uh, she's typing very hard. Uh, our communication manager is sitting there. So maybe uh, she can, uh, we can, we can start, we can start this campaign. She's got time enough to do that. <laughs> join forces. Yes, we have to join forces. And she needs help. We all need help. So it can't be only uh, coming from HQ, which is very tiny, tiny, tiny. Sorry, yes. You can. Uh, I mean, you can take one uh, microphone if you... Um, maybe uh, one of the ladies can help and... And, um, yeah. and maybe you can... Oh, yeah, maybe you can come, otherwise come forward. But, uh, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Debbie. I um, belong to the Sauroptimus of Malaysia, but I'm actually a South African. So I have an understanding of the suffering of girls 
on different levels, having lived in different places in the world. And one of the things that we've all agreed on is that the way that climate change affects women is very much a, a function of where those women are. So women in Africa and women in rural areas and women in the poorer communities in the world suffer disproportionately when compared to women in more developed countries. And as you've already said, part of the problem emanates from the progress that was already made in the developed countries that the underdeveloped countries are now paying for. And also, the paradox and, the, and, and I think the difficulty is that those very same underdeveloped countries are now not really able to make the same technological advances. It's a bit of a, a Western Eurocentric kind of viewpoint that um, we must now all be green. But there are people on the planet who have absolutely nothing. And their priority is not environmentally friendly. Their priority is to eat and to survive. So balancing that when you are dealing with Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you are dealing with women and children <clears throat> who, I beg your pardon, who are still starving is, is a very tough question. Um, and one of the things that I think that as, as seroptimists that we can do, and you've alluded to it now, we are waiting for governments and we are waiting for the United Nations and we are waiting for people um, to rally around us to make these changes. We are 75,000 women. We can do this on our own. We don't need to wait. We so can... we, we're, not, we're not going to wait anymore. Yeah. We're going to take action. Did you have a yeah. question? My question is, how can we mobilize our own organization so that we can take advantage of that? Because we don't have um, connections to one another where we, I think we are sharing what, was, what is going on and we, um, we are able to leverage one another's resources. Some of the clubs have money. Some of the clubs have um, more problems. And I think if we could, if we could start using um, internet platforms or, and that's the question, how are we, get, can we, can we communicate I think, with one I another? I think we just started yeah. answering that question, that we had a, uh, that if we start this communication platform, if we start this, um, uh, this campaign on, and, and take action all together, join hands, not like, oh, well, we, um, I'm a Sroptimist International of Europe, so I'm not going to share that with, uh, with, the future African federations, no way. So I think that is one of the things. And I loved one of your ministers uh, in South Africa. She, she always said, nothing about them without them. And I think we can do that. As women, nothing about them without them. So involve them. And we have the, the links to the grassroots and not... I, Know, for example, that I talked to one of the big shots at the World Bank at a certain stage, and, uh, she, and he said to me, he said, well, he said, what are you complaining about? You have Madame Lagarde, so she can sort out your finance problem. And I said, yes, but that is not really what we want. So if we take this action, I think that is the best, the best solution. Um, I give Mary the floor, the floor first because she wanted to answer, and then I'll come back to you. Thank you. I think you raised pertinent issues. Sorry, I can't remember the name. Just the previous uh, speaker who just spoke and, uh, from South Africa. And the, the, the call for everyone to get into action has got to be practical. We have initiatives with women and girls in our projects at every local level. And for example, do, you, do, you, do we see how climate change, environmental matters affects women's health in terms of uh, feminine hygiene? What are some of the solutions in terms of provision of sanitary pads that are environment friendly, that are going to help girls so that they can stay more in school? And we, shall still, we will still be protecting environment by having such a product. So we can't take that as our initiative. And economically speaking, to uh, my sister who spoke about money, is that uh, such productions can be done locally by women groups, that we can train and provide the facilities for them to provide reusable sanitary pads at local communities as their income generating activities and protecting their girls. And so what you are really saying is uh, all the projects you're doing uh, can be related to climate change. So you don't have to start thinking of something innovative now. Uh, 
menstrual hygiene, you can automatically link it. But explain that to the people, to the the grassroots people, but also to your club and also to your country. And to show them that everything is included. Inclusiveness is the word. Hello, my name is uh, Ralda Fawson. and I'm with uh, Sir Optimist International Bayside in Australia. And I'd just like to share a project that is a partner project between SI Bayside and SI Lay, and we call it Sir Optimist Lighting the Way to Climate Justice. And we call it Lighting the Way. Just a, It has a, a supporting website. And um, the concept is very simple, that when we fly on holidays or travel on holidays or to conventions, we offset our emissions involved in that flight and we pay that into the Lighting the Way fund. And then that money is used to support women and children in villages who have no electricity, who have a lack. And the Sir Optimus in Papua New Guinea know these women. They talk to these women. They, they, they know the local communities. They do all the work on the ground. They do all the distribution. And we, in the developing countries, um, collect, okay. the, collect the money and pay, at least pay some payback and I look at our own ecological idea. footprint. And that's something easy we can do. Yes. Sort of just, uh, we go and make flights, a big, long, long haul flights, and pay a little bit towards the project. And uh, very well done. Yes. Yeah, my name's Arlene Mitchell, though a lot of Sorotmans know me as Mitch. Uh, I, too, am in SI Bayside. I would uh, really like to commend the speakers who have talked about advocacy. I truly believe that Sorotmans do not use this tool strongly enough. Many years ago, I was in an environmental education centre. The government in Queensland threatened to close them down. We put together an advocacy kit which had 10 points and a paragraph to support each one, sent it out to every Sir Optimus Club in Queensland, asked both the clubs and the individuals to choose segments to then send to the government. Ladies, that was a day of faxes. I imagined how much harder it was then. But I got a phone call within 24 hours from somebody I knew in government saying, Mitch, what on earth is happening? We've got runners coming from the education department, the environment department, the premier's department. Those environmental education centres are still functioning today. Well done. Thank you very much, Mitch. So uh, I've got another question I can see. And this is a workshop, so everyone is allowed to, to ask the questions. Thank you. I'm Annelies Stebrunner from Switzerland, the president, and uh, I'm agree with you. It's not a shame to deal with the politicians in our country, and we have to do it. And uh, we have to think an, in a political structure in our country and to, to deal and to fight with the political in our country. Thank, Thank you. you. So, in a way, we always have been too modest. I think that's it. Jacqueline. Well, I want to follow up on that, this last point and uh, repeat what I said about uh, a national uh, strategy which really includes also the points made by the previous interventions. And that is make a strategy of yourself and try to get... Uh, at least a couple of people to help you and probably the UNEP, you are involved in that, can help to see whether the really uh, the real good, good people that, that can help you uh, can uh, help formulate the uh, strategy. And uh, that can be done in, in a couple of months because the peop we know what we have to do. And put that on the table and also say we want to have money for these and these and these actions. Then you are very concrete and practical. But they never have money. They're so poor. But now, with the UNFCCC, you have the right to ask for the money. 
And if that, the government doesn't uh, pay for it, you go to other places. Perhaps the, 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 uh, the World Bank says, the World okay, Bank we set aside money. Uh, <laughs> some money. Because the World Bank only you, gives to governments. No, they no, don't but, give to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the point is, you know, we, we have to put pressure on, on every uh, body, body yeah, the, the, every organization, to mobilize the money that is less as uh, Yoyeta explained, then what goes through all the uh, regular channels? True, and I think, thank you, Jacqueline, I think it is tr it, it's true to the partnerships that we have got to build, because they have got to be very inclusive. We cannot shy away with working with the governments, like, like she says, that whether they are political or not, we need them because they legislate and make the scene where we do our work either possible or not possible. An example is about, again, the sanitary pads, uh, government levies. For example, it has made it very expensive for, uh, for girls who are poor to afford a sanitary pad. We had to advocate and have our government in Kenya remove, eliminate the tax for sanitary pads, which they agreed after a long, long struggle. So we need the, uh, the partnerships, and we have to be strong and come out and stand up for women and girls. I think Yante wants to say something. Thank you very much. No, I think there is, you know, a couple of great barriers we have, right, to, to getting to our climate action at scale. One is clearly financing. I'll come back to that. And the other is the capacity, the adaptive capacity or even the capacity to absorb some of these funds. And I think it's important to, to, to keep both of those in mind. But that's not to say that financing isn't an issue. I mean, financing is an issue. I think Joyita highlighted it. And even as development institutions, uh, like the World Bank, we just put out a climate uh, actions and target plan in December of last year that will, you know, mobilize, uh, including 100 billion of the bank's own financing over a period of five years, but to also mobilize another 100 billion through private sector and working with um, a multilateral investment guarantee agency. But even those monies are going to be a drop in the ocean of the needs. I mean, that's the reality. But the idea is how do you use this money to uh, influence and inform transformation at scale? But I want to come back to the Soroptimist because I think it's, it's very exciting, the conversation that is going on here. And I think, you know, obviously coming out of this convention, uh, there should be a real short, sharp thinking process on how best to position your advantage. And while I think action on the ground is really the way to go, it a, should be part of your longer term strategy on mobilizing, financing, organizing yourself and making sure you build even more networks within the countries to do your local action. I think your biggest quick win is I think the point made on the global advocacy platform. On day one when I saw the global advocacy, I think that voice of all of these 120 plus countries coming to your membership, you know, can really put something on the map that I think is driven from a woman's perspective. The idea of the woman is now here. You know, I think that solution space is here. The, the opportunities everywhere, there is a real push to sort of have a gendered perspective to think, but let's make it count, count for something real, as you say, with them, for them, and about them. And I think you can make that difference. So I think sharpening that advocacy piece, you know, building on that would be a really enormous contribution and a platform, because I know from the development perspective, we want to give sometimes attention to the gendered size, and there is even targets that have to be met. But sometimes it doesn't come out in the final play because the capacities are not there, the voice is not there. So I hope that, you know, Sir Optimus can help in that context. Thank you. Um, you Asha, Asha, you want to direct. Um, thank you very much for the challenge. And I've just been speaking to our UN rep here and said, we have been talking about climate change in this particular forum. So we'll make a report and take it to the perspective because they have a, a magazine which is a perspective. Maybe we don't use that tool as much as we should, but we tried. The last two environment uh, awareness days, we actually did action. And as optimists, we were captured on that. And we had them come to our, 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 our action. And uh, I hope worldwide 
we'll all call whoever is around when we have an international day to come and capture what we do. And we all put it up together. Um, we'll have a stronger voice. We are so many all over the world. And we are doing it quietly, as you say. We will not work in silos. We will definitely shout out and make, it, make us aware. And I'm sure, I can see Alice waving her, shaking her head. We will come up loud. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, Asha. Then Yoita. Um, I just wanted to react to the point made by the South African lady who is in Malaysia. Uh, she brought up the issue of are we bringing up a Eurocentric perspective in the room by saying that rich countries have caused the problem and are not willing to pay for the adaptation and at the same time we're asking the poor countries to sacrifice their right to develop because they can't use the oil or the gas or the coal that they have still in their mines. And this is really a dilemma and we discuss this a lot in class and I think the problem is that if, for example, Mozambique, Ghana and Kenya now use their newly found oil gas uh, reserves, then they will spend money to build the infrastructure to take these things out and build massive infrastructures in their countries to bring the gas to all the households. And then within 20 years, they'll have to phase it out. So they will be left with very, very much of stranded assets. All the investments you put in now, you won't be able to take in the long-term benefits of that if you go that path. So ultimately, maybe the solar and the re uh, renewable energy is much cheaper in the long term. And in the Netherlands, we're now trying to close down our gas infrastructure, and that's so expensive. And we've already been using it for a long time. So uh, I, I think for many developing countries, the question to think is, is it smarter to invest in something that in the long term is better for the developing country rather than invest in something that may make you rich in the short term but may cause a lot of problems in the long term. Thank you very much. I, we are, I mean, I think we can go on till tonight, but I mean, that's not allowed, so we won't do that. Uh, I would like, uh, my, the last question I got here, and I thought, shall I, shan't I, but I'm going to do it. Um, and you all get 15 seconds. So... What do the speakers themselves do in their private lives to make a change that can be an example to all of us? And I'll start, <laughs> I'll start at the end. Thank you, Kanta. You're welcome. Um, when Jacqueline was talking about the LED, I thought that was interesting because I think it's come all the way around where we really have to, to, to do this. And I mean, in a home, I think that's one of the things that we are very particular about. Recycling is, is another. And one thing that I, we've done not so regularly is trying to now determine our, our sort of budget so that we can actually send money more uh, systematically. My husband's from Haiti where we try to send money to have the trees uh, at the seaside. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, do, I have solar panels on my roof. Uh, all the lights are LED. And I use a public transport and a folding cycle to go to work and come back. Good. <laughs> I have the same list. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, I, I try to add to that. Um, I try to be conscious about what I buy and particularly what I should not buy. <laughs> um, I uh, also have no car, do everything by bike or public transportation. Uh, I'm aware of how and when I fly and I, and, or travel. And uh, I also, in my private life, I am active in my own neighborhood to uh, make the whole neighborhood more sustainable, uh, energy uh, and also waste uh, problems that uh, arise. And furthermore, I'm very active in all kinds of organizations. The Plastic Soup Foundation is a priority, the Signify uh, Foundation. So I have about 20 uh, different activities that all contribute to a better sustainable life. Okay. Kusum. Uh, like I said the first day, I like the Middle Eastern uh, two-minute shower. I, maybe mine is five. Uh, I also uh, make sure that we had a collapse of a garbage bank, uh, garbage mountain, which killed people. And after that, I'm very conscious about pushing garbage separation and reuse. 
I try to plant a tree, not all the time, when I fly. Uh, but I think more than that, I spend a lot of time telling people or nagging people about rainwater harvesting and collecting water and uh, groundwater recharge, which is a very, I mean, it's almost unknown. So don't pave your courtyards and gardens, you know, let the water seep in and recharge groundwater. I try, I implement what the women are doing. I just don't get the women to do it, but I do it at my own. If it's a vegetable garden, the wet moist boy, I do it. If it's a stove, I have built it before I go and take it to the people. So I try and do those. Then I know what the repercussions are before I take it to somebody else. So I'm trying to walk the talk. Thank you. Yes, and I also have a solar heating uh, panel for my water in the house. I purposely and consciously don't have a washing machine. In, I do washing by hand so that it is, I, I protect the environment. And I spend a lot of my professional time working, working with adolescent girls and young women, and I raise awareness about use of reusable sanitary pads to the girls and women. Thank you. And I do a lot of what these ladies do. And I have another issue that is I've got four boys and a husband, and they all like meat. So uh, we said, I mean, no meat is not a, uh, an option, but... Uh, uh, only meet two times or three times a week. And they all started doing that. And one of them is now no, not eating meat at all. So, I mean, that's a start as well. Thank you very much. Um, don't you think they've been wonderful? You know? And we have been so fortunate to have this workshop enhanced by the presence of all our climate warriors. Let's all give them a big hand and thank you, President Merritt, for moderating it. And we're going to join hands and start this action and nothing about them without them. Thank you very much.